morning, I'm Rick, I'm the pastor of the River Church. If I've not met you yet, I will try and grab you at the end. And today we're starting a mini, just three-week series in John 17, which is a very famous bit of the Bible, sometimes called the High Priestly Prayer. And I have to say, it's an absolutely corking bit of scripture. And like, all right, I know, okay, all of the Bible is God-breathed, is fit for a proof. I've read 2 Timothy, okay, but this is what uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, once wrote as perhaps the most sacred passage in the four Gospels. For this chapter is a rich and honoured peak into the life of the Godhead, the Trinity, the God who is three in one. As Jesus, the Son, the titular high priest, he prays to his Father in heaven. In John 17 are the intimate whispers that have murmured through eternity as Father, Son and Spirit, the three persons of our one God, planned and spoke creation, salvation and resurrection into being. What a privilege this morning to be a fly on the wall in the boardroom meeting of God. In some ways, actually, Tim kicked us off uh, last week. Tim Bunker, guest preacher from Nottingham, in fact, he came up and he spoke on the Trinity. You You can find that on our podcast if you've not listened to it already. And what does Jesus pray in, uh, in John 17? Well, what does a priest do? A priest stands in the gap, historically stood in the gap between God and man. And so Jesus prays uh, first for himself, and that's the verses we're going to look at today, verses 1 to 5 of chapter 17. And then he looks out to those who he's standing in the gap for, his disciples who are around him, uh, verses 6 to 19 that we'll look at at Phil's house next week. And then, the most wonderful bit, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll be back here. He prays for all Christians ever, verses 20 to 26, which means you. It means you. If you know Jesus, you are in these pages as Christ prays for you. Isn't that amazing? But that's for a fortnight's time. Hey, if you do live in Birmingham, do come up, you know. Sack off your church, it's fine. I'll square it with Steve. John 17 then, verses 1 to 5. When Jesus had spoken these words, he's done lots of teaching up to this point, when he'd spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you've given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, we've got a lot of um, guests here today, and so what that means, I don't know all of your church backgrounds, so I don't know where you're from. I've been getting to know the, the one things over the last couple of days, but I don't know everyone, so I don't know where you've come from. If you've been to church, if you've not, you're welcome. But where I grew up, the environment in which I was in, the three-point sermon was king, all right? You, like, here's the passage, and here's three points about it. Why three points? Well, because in speech, rhetoric, just as in music and in comedy, there's kind of a, a cadence and a rhythm of threes that just makes our souls sing. I don't think it's a surprise when we're made in the image of a triune God, but that's a whole other sermon. But also in terms of, it helps us remember. What did, what did he talk about today? I don't know, I zoned out. But there was that, there's this, and then there was this, and then there was this. Yeah, it helps us remember. Bad news today, I've only got two points. Doesn't mean it's shorter, but I've only got... <laughs> you wish. <laughs> only two points, and it's this in verse 1. Glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. That's Jesus' prayer. Glorify your son, he says to the father, that the son may glorify you. Christ asks to be glorified in order that he might give glory to the father. He is eternally the given away God, isn't he? He gives himself away even back to the father. Wow. Wow. But I'm aware, by the way, that we've uh, jumped into the narrative sort of artificially. Like, where are we? What what is John 17? Well, actually, we don't really know for definite where we are. Um, The Holy Spirit, writing through John, hasn't given us uh, geographic details, so that 
actually means we don't have to get too bogged down in that, so that's okay. But we do get an idea of where when we start answering when this is. For, Jesus says, the hour has come. The hour has come. And if you had read John, the rest of it up to this point, you'd realize that John is finally reaping the tension that he has sown throughout his gospel. All the way back in chapter 2, Jesus says to his mother, my hour has not yet come. She'd come to him and said, they've run out of wine. He's like, why are you bothering me? My hour has not yet come. And yet he turns water to wine. As a, in a foreshadowing of the new life and land that will be won in this hour. It's amazing. You move on to, to chapter 4. Jesus encounters a woman at the well. And he says to her, the hour is coming. When neither in Samaria or in Jerusalem you will worship God. But who, whoever you are, wherever you are, even in Usburn, you will be able to worship the Father in spirit and truth. Wow. And Jesus said, chapter 5, that in that hour, the dead would be called, raised, the dead would be raised, and judged by the Son. Scary, but incredible. So you read John's Gospel, and you look forward to this hour that's coming. And it sounds brilliant. And then you keep reading, and it starts to turn a little sour. Because when Jesus avoids arrest, twice, once in the temple, then the treasury, in chapter 7 and 8, John tells us that it's because his hour hadn't come. Implying that this brilliant hour is somehow marked by arrest. When Jesus announces in chapter 12, the hour of glory, hey, it's, a, it's upon him. It's, it's coming. It's near. He then follows it up and starts talking about death. Ugh. About a seed going in the ground and dying so that it rises up and produces much fruit. Even in the previous few verses to this, in chapter 16, Jesus has told his disciples that they will be scattered in this hour. John has built tension to this point. The hour hadn't come, the hour hadn't come, the hour hadn't come, and now, says Jesus, Father, the hour has come. When the dead would be raised, when new wineskins would be needed, where all flesh, not just those in a particular corner of the world, would know the voice and authority of the Son. This is Jesus' moment of glory. This is how the Father glorifies the Son. How? Because strange as it may seem, when Jesus calls on the Father and says, glorify your Son, what he's saying is, give me strength. Send your Spirit to empower me to endure the arrest, the death, and the abandonment that marks this hour. You see, when we think of glory, when we read a, a verse like, glorify me, God, we think of wealth, success, fame. When Jesus speaks of glory, he speaks of execution. And so it's in this mood of execution that actually many conclude that this is John's account of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, on the Mount of Olives. The moment that in the other Gospels, he's reported as fervently praying to the Father, take the cup away from me. Take this suffering away from me. The spirit is willing, yes, but the flesh is weak. I don't want to be crucified. And he prays so hard that he sweats blood. But he's ultimately obedient. This is the hour, the moment, the day of the Lord that's been prophesied for centuries. Remember Zechariah, we preached it this time last year. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming when his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14. Jesus has said in chapter 12, In this hour I will be lifted up from the earth. Again, we think of glory, you know. On a mountain, looking cool. <coughs> But know the following verses to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Because he was lifted up from the earth on a stick, a cursed tree, to take scorn, shame and suffering and even death onto himself. Glorify your son, Jesus says. Lift up your son. And so he is. Because straight after this prayer, in chapter 18, he's arrested and tried and crucified and abandoned. 
this is his moment of glory. I think we would expect in our moments of glory to be held up for all to see, yes. But in a moment that makes us look good. Yet Christ's moment of glory is sacrifice, name-calling, beatings, tearings, piercings. Now this is one of those moments in John's Gospel where Jesus sneakily announced that he is God because he's asking to share in the glory of God and God doesn't do that easily. He's like, well, that, the only way that works is if he is God. Let's not dig too much into that because we don't want to miss what's happening. Jesus is saying, my moment of glory is coming. It's here. The hour has come and it is my death. And friends, if you're a Christian here today, if you are in Christ, if you've been baptized into a death like his and are resurrected into a life like his, you are called, therefore, to live a life like him. Very few of us, particularly in the West, are called to die for our faith. But I do think this challenges our perspective on glory because what's your moment of glory what's the the moment you dream of visualize you know surrounded by adoring supporters passing exams with flying colors scoring a great goal at five aside I did a very nice header on Thursday by the way perhaps it's in the church getting to preach Leading a Bible study, leading worship. Whatever it looks like for you, I expect, like me, your imagined moments of glory don't look like the cross. Surrounded by people, yes, but in jeers and not cheers. And yet this is the life to which we're called. Service, sacrifice, and scorn. But, hallelujah, our salvation, our righteousness, our resurrection, our eternal life, to use Jesus' words, is not one on lost but on how much we measure up to this life of service to which we're called. Hallelujah. Our victory is not in performance, but in the glory of the cross. Because when we look upon him, remember Zechariah again, when we look upon him who is pierced, him who is bleeding, him who bears the nails due us and our sin, him who is without sin and became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God, when we look on him, we are saved. Hallelujah. When I'm lifted up from the earth, he said in chapter 12, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. This is the glory of Jesus, that he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, it says in Philippians. And everyone whom the Father gives to the Son by imparting faith by the Spirit receives eternal life and will be with him in resurrected glory. Verse 5, now Father, glorify me in your own presence. Take me into your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. It's into that glory. Can you get your head around that? It's into that glory, that eternal life that we now enter because of Christ. That's what we've worshipped about all morning, isn't it? That amazing step into glory that we get to take. That he is the high priest, the great high priest who stands in the gap between God and man. The gap we could never have crossed. And then he said, no, I will be both God and both man. And now you will cross through me and my cross. This is the glory of the cross that Christ began in glory in the presence of the Father, came to earth, took on flesh, took on death, was resurrected and ascended back into glory, back to his Father, and calls us with him. We were so far from God, we couldn't hope to measure up, but he came to us, hallelujah, and took our sin, shame, death onto his own body, and defeated them, calling us into glory, the very presence of the triune God. This is the truth. You can't earn the favor of God, forgiveness of sins, freedom for shame, or eternal life, but just by imitating Christ, or by being your best you, or by living your best life, a life lived like Christ comes one way, by his spirit dwelling within you. When we cry out for help, just as Jesus did. And how do we receive that? Again, we do, we do what we did this morning. We gaze on him. Lifted up from the earth in his moment of glory, naked, bleeding, ridiculed, crucified, and declare him Lord over our lives. This is what Paul means when he says it's foolishness to the Greeks, the stumbling block to the Jews, scorn of the Romans, and idiocy to the secularists. That guy? 
the naked bleeding one, that's your king? That's your Lord? That's the one you bow down to and say, yeah, you can have my life? It's madness, isn't it? Yet when we gaze on him in his moment of glory, so we return to glory with him and receive the resurrection of Christ that came three days later. Glorify your son, cries out Jesus. That the son may glorify you. I don't know about you, but I, when I sat down to study this, I thought, how? How? How does Christ glorify the Father at this moment? And how is it that a, a naked, bleeding Savior glorifies God? Well, there's a couple of reasons, and one we've already begun to explore. Firstly, that the Father is glorified in the crucifixion of the Son since, it says in verse 2, since, because of, as a result of, the crucifixion and resurrection, the hour of Jesus, because he's done that, the Father has given him authority to impart eternal life to those who receive it. This is John's shtick, isn't it? We know this one. John 3.16, probably the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him might not perish, but have eternal life. Yeah? This is familiar. Because Christ did this, the Father has given him the keys of eternal life. And Jesus then clarifies it a little bit. Verse 3, this is eternal life, that they know you. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. This is how the Son glorifies the Father in his crucifixion, that by the saving work of the cross, by the resurrection on the third day, and by the Spirit poured out on all flesh after his ascension, we know God. Since Christ is glorified, the Son is given authority to give eternal life, knowledge of God to all whom the Father says so. And a knowledge that causes us to glorify God. That's how the Father is glorified. The Father is revealed to us. We who were dead in our sins and our pride because of the cross, we now know God. You're all looking kind of, I know I just love when you're listening to someone like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, no. We know God. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> we know God. It's madness. You get your head around that, you know God. Yeah, that's St. Paul's definition of what it is to be a Christian, isn't it? Galatians 4, formerly you didn't know God, but now you know God. Cool. <laughs> Last night, actually, we were, um, Anne was leading a session with the one thing, guys, about we, we the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. God who spoke creation into being. He said, oh, there's nothing. How about light? And light there was. Oh, there's water. Maybe we should, oceans? Yeah, he did that. And you know that voice? Are you not quaking in your boots? This is good news, isn't it? I mean, if you're a Christian here today, I don't think I can say anything better to you today than you know God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Humanity longs for it. Other religions might claim to know about God. Secular humanists deny there is a God, but you, you know God. Wow. And also, if you know biblical language, you also know that to know implies not just information, but intimacy. See, I, I think we can get a bit weirded out by the idea of eternal life. Yeah, anyone? It's going to be a bit boring. Anyone feel like that sometimes? Is it, is it, am I going to get tired? Is it just like this life, but a bit long? Because I really could do with a nap. <laughs> now, no one can tell you exactly what heaven's going to be like, but we do get snapshots of it in the Bible. And this is one of them. Eternal life is the knowledge of God. D.A. Carson put it like this. Eternal life isn't so much everlasting life as knowledge of the everlasting one. This is the point of the gospel all the way from the garden to the exodus through the exile to today that they shall know me. That language runs through the Bible, doesn't it? They shall know me, it says in Jeremiah, from the least to the greatest. It's the cry of our hearts that we would know God. In the words of St. Augustine, he, you've made us feel self and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in you. Hey, it's even how John's gospel starts. If you know John, chapter 1, verse 18, Tim alluded to it last week even. No one has ever seen God. I think we can affirm that, yeah? 
No one's ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. No one's seen God, but in Christ, he has made him known. Do you know there's a remarkable truth in that? That God is unknowable, and yet in his mercy makes himself knowable in the person of Christ, in the Word, and the Spirit. Both those things are true. That he's unknowable and yet knowable. And if both those things are true, and they are, it means actually that we're going to keep on getting to know him better for all eternity. We will see him in all his glory. But we'll never go, yeah, good, God, sussed. (laughs) We're going to keep getting to know him better. Which means eternity is not so much measured in length of time, but depth of knowledge of God. And again, not knowledge that puffs us up, but a knowledge that leads to the glory of God, the praise of God, the worship of God. And this is key. Because I know what it's like, right? You become a Christian, and it's amazing. It's wonderful. I know God! Yeah! Again, I was five when it happened, so I liked being able to stay up for the grown-up meeting in the evening of the Bible camp we were at. That was the best bit. But you know, you become a Christian. I know God. You're free. You're forgiven. The church is amazing. It's full of people that know God. None of them are ever annoying or sinful. (laughs) A judicious cough. And then you do some early discipleship. Wow! And you do some deeper study. Wow! Perhaps you do the one thing here. Wow! (laughs) Then Jesus sets you free by his spirit, by strongholds that have held you for, for years. Wow! And then one day, sneakily, suddenly, you're not sure how it happened, you suddenly go, yeah, I know God. Yeah, I know about God. I know... Do you know, I haven't really got anything else to learn. I know all about God. Please tell me this isn't just me. Nothing seems to surprise you about God anymore. Friends, if, if you know Jesus, you have eternity of getting to know him better. That's the truth. So let me tell you something. There's no way you're finished yet. There's no way you're finished yet. But maybe there is a challenge here for some of us who are, are in or have been in that place of like, yeah, I feel like I know everything. Now, I've, you know, kind of covered the theology stuff. Yeah. Maybe there's a challenge to stop getting to know about God, but seek to know God. It's not about information, but intimacy. Seeking to get to know God in a way that leads to glorification for this is how the father is glorified that you know God and that leads me neatly to uh, the second way which the text tells us that the crucifixion of Christ glorifies the father and I will be done fairly soon and Isabel you've done brilliantly so uh, but hold on just a second longer Verse 4, I glorified you on earth, Jesus said, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. Of course he hasn't yet. (laughs) Done now, don't have to do the cross. No, he knows he's going to, he's yet to go, he's praying for strength to see it through. Why? Because the Father is glorified in finished work. The Father is glorified in finished work. Why? Because that's what he's like. He's the ultimate completer finisher. He who began a good work in you, it says in Philippians, will call it off near the end. (laughs) Bring it to completion. Hallelujah. The Father is glorified in finished work. And Christ is calling out here for strength so that in just a few short excruciating hours he might declare it is finished. Friends, we... We don't have to go through what he went through. But Christ is the ultimate example to us of seeing something through, of being obedient all the way to death and out the other side. For the Father is glorified in finished works. The Father, friends, has revealed himself to you. You know God. 
by the regenerating power of his spirit through the finished work of his son. And now you are called to know and glorify him. Here is God's word to you. Finish the race. Complete the task. You know the right thing. We looked at in James just a couple of months ago. So do it. That's how Maya started our worship today. Put off everything. Sin and distractions. Finish the race. For the Father is glorified in finished works. Perhaps you're finishing one thing. The call is to finish well. And not let your attentions and labor drift. Ah, it's the last few weeks. They don't pay me anyway. (laughs) Perhaps you've been part of this church planting business at the River Church for what seems like a very long time now. (laughs) And it's slow growing. It's starting to wear you down. Perhaps it's marriage. It's harder than you thought. Perhaps it's parenthood. That's harder than you thought. Perhaps it's singleness and you just don't know if you can keep it up much longer. The Father is glorified in finished works. But hallelujah, Jesus called for strength. And if he called for strength to finish the work, how much more do you need that he was fully man he fully understands exactly what you're going through and yet he was fully God okay we can fall into a couple of problems here you can say oh well you know I don't have to fast for 40 days I'm not necessarily recommending that but you know when you hear that sort of that only Jesus could do that because he was God well no he was fully man don't downplay that aspect anyway I can't get to all of that we haven't got time <laughs> no um, <laughs> don't tempt me but he knows what it's like to be you. And of course he's God and he has the will of God. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. And he needed help. So I'm not here to tell you, finish the race or else he will be displeased. No, finish the race. You can't do it. So ask for help. And we're going to maybe make some time for that. Yeah, we've got some time. Katie's going to lead us to that in just a moment. But I want us to remember the purpose as we finish of this passage. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. That's Jesus' prayer. Give me strength, Father, to see this through that many might come to know you and glorify you. And that's how we're going to finish. By glorifying Jesus. Amen? We're going to glorify God. Yes, there's challenge to keep running the race. Put aside our own pride and glory. But truly, our role here is to glorify Christ as he glorifies the Father and give thanks that by his spirit and his sacrifice our eyes are opened as we've sung and that we might know God. Amen.